So let me give you the outline on never forget. Number one, Jesus reminded them of his power. And the reason he is doing this is because he, this is probably either the last or the, probably the next to last time uh, that Jesus would be with the disciples. So he wanted to remind him of these things that were going on. So Jesus reminded them of his power. Number two, Jesus reminded them of his provision. Uh, provision, okay? And number three, Jesus reminded them of his presence. And uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, really, I feel like in, in our own lives, you know, I sense the presence of Jesus all the time, okay? In my prayer time, uh, in preparation time, uh, I talked to someone on the phone today, uh, and they just said, uh, they called me to tell me that the service Sunday, it, it was the, the most spirit-filled service now, here's what they said. They have ever been in, okay, ever, okay? And I'm just like, I thought it was pretty good, the, the Spirit. But what I'm saying is not everyone would make that statement, but I think if you were here, you would say the Holy Spirit was here. There's no doubt on that, okay? So uh, I hope as we mature in Christ, we have a stronger presence of the Holy Spirit. We sense the Holy Spirit and I, I shy away from the word feel, all right, because feelings come and go. Faith is forever, folks, okay? There's times I don't feel like doing things, and I, I can't go by feelings. i got to go by faith. And so Jesus is, again, using an example. And the, the thing that you have to realize is, I'm telling you, this is the it, almost the exact same thing that happened in Luke chapter 5. This whole scenario, same place, same people, Everything happened in Luke 5. Well, why would he do it? I mean, two years, I mean, two years earlier, that was Luke. And then he turns around and he does it again as one of the last conversations that he has with the disciples. What is he saying? Well, one is for emphasis and two is for importance. Why do you have a lesson over again? Why do you go over this lesson again? He was making sure the disciples understood what he was talking about. So let's look in uh, John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again. And uh, I believe this is the third time that he showed himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And again, the Sea of Galilee actually uh, is probably what we know it more than Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself, okay? Visibly, you could see Jesus. Okay, it wasn't just a spirit being, okay? Even though I, I believe he probably glowed, okay? We're not talking about an angelic form. They literally saw Jesus. And it says, and then they give the list, Simon Peter, Thomas, uh, called the twin, Nathaniel, uh, uh, Cana, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and we know James and John, the two, and two other of his disciples were together. So there were seven of them all together there. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now I notice there was two thoughts that come to mind when it says I'm going fishing. One is you would think, hey, what, did, what was a hobby of Peter's? All right, it was more than a hobby, it was a job. This is, even as commercial fishermen, you might get burned out in having to go to work. But if you are a com commercial fishing, fisherman, you also fish recreationally. And this is what I'm leaning towards, okay? I'm leaning towards, we kind of have a downtime. We've talked to Jesus. We're not sure exactly what we're going to do, okay? Because he hadn't quite gave him the axe spill, axe and what is going to, you know, happen in axe. So I'm going to side with that. Whereas even some of the writers said, Peter shouldn't have went fishing, okay? That was his old life, all right? He, he, he was going to lead the church, and, and, and again, you know, if you remember what's after this, I preached a sermon just not too long ago about Jesus restoring. Do you love me? He asked him three times, okay? So, again, I think it was in that transition time, and I, I see nothing wrong personally with going fishing. And they said to him, uh, we are going with you also. And they went out immediately and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And it's just... Uh, amazing the parallels between these two stories 
which were two years apart. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Again, it hadn't been long enough for them for, to forget who Jesus was, but my guess is it was probably where they were fishing. And folks, I, we, we grew up on a lake, Fort Cobb in, in Oklahoma, and we loved to fish, we loved to ski, I played golf there. But I'm saying when you're in the middle of a lake and you look on the shore, you just sometimes, if you're far enough out, just see an image. You just can tell that's probably a man. I'm not really sure whether it's a man or not. But it, it, and that's what I think, uh, you know, that Jesus, he wasn't trying to hide because he was going to reveal himself if they had not figured it out. Uh, but uh, none of them knew who Jesus was. And then Jesus said unto them, and this is the part that tells me he wasn't out in the middle and he's hollering at them. Okay, we're not talking about hollering at somebody. Uh, children, have you any food? And that's an that's a, a interesting phrase that Jesus used. Uh, when we talk mainly about children, uh, we are talking about, you know, even in their faith, they are young. So he's basically saying, it, and this is, again, my interpretation of it, you are really not where you need to be, okay? You, I am preparing you. I, I went through those three and a half years, okay, for, for, for you to take over. I, I've already left. You, you, you know I've left. You know, uh, you know that I have to go back to heaven. I'm going to go ascend to my Father. But, but right now, you know, and again, I, I don't think you, it's associated with because they were fishing. It was just... Uh, uh, again, the, the phrase, when, like today, I, I, I get, you know, I go home for just a little while, and Kylie's at our house, she's, she's at our house all day Wednesday, all day Fridays, and I'm telling you, when I opened the door, she was across the room, and she yells, Papa, and just takes off running for me, okay? Now, folks, you grandparents know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, it is one of the neatest feelings that you had in my life in your life. And here's what I, I don't take that as a negative, is what Jesus was saying, because really the teaching phase of that, okay, he was saying, you know, there's still life lessons to learn. That's to me what he is saying. And they answered him, no, do you have any food? Which is an interesting uh, uh, question, not knowing who the person was. Uh, in verse 6, and he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So, uh, you know, I use the word baiting here, okay? When he made that statement, they should have figured out. You know how you have them aha moments or the light comes on? Well, that's what I think should have took place here because it is the exact thing that he told him to do. So they cast out, uh, cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. And folks, pre-resurrection, post-resurrection, I'm telling you, Jesus can do anything. All right? Our God and Jesus can do anything. There is no such thing as an impossible situation with God. Okay? There isn't. Um, turn to John 15. Let's go back a few chapters here. Just, just a few chapters. John 15. Jesus had taught this lesson, and it Obviously, chronologically, in John chapter 15, it hadn't been that long ago. He says, in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Okay? Every branch uh, in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken in you. In verse 4 and 5 is the one and the key to what he was trying to say, abide in me and I in you. He said, even though I'm leaving, we can still abide in Christ. Folks, you can abide in Christ today. You can hang around Jesus today. You hang around his word, you're hanging around Jesus. You pray, you're hanging around Jesus. So he's telling us the key is, hey, physically you don't see me, but spiritually, I'm everywhere, and I can still do anything, okay? I can do anything. I can empower you, and that's what he was going to do, folks. 
He was going to empower them to heal and cast out demons. And then uh, it says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit, then, then it, uh, in the vine, neither uh, can you unless you abide in me. So he you know, reiterates that. Verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bears much fruit. Now here's the phrase I wanted to get to, for without me, you can do nothing. And you can apply this to the story. They got out there and they fished all night and they caught nothing. Neil. And folks, if you fished all night, you would think you'd get a bite. You would think you would accidentally hook one or something. Okay, but for some reason, nothing bit. They come in in the daytime, which even in the daytime, I mean, it's good fishing, you know, time. But from what happened and what he is saying there, I'm just telling you, it's just what happened was just something incredible, okay? Incredible, because it says a multitude of fish. And folks, it wasn't that they, you know, just got lucky or there was a fishing hole and they just got in the right hole. No, they heard Jesus, they obeyed Jesus, and, got, and he gave the increase, folks. Folks, it's not our job. When we present the gospel, folks, it's not our, our job to save people. I've never saved a soul in my life. Never have. But God uses us through the Word of God and the Spirit of God to show people how to be saved. So we look at that, and, and a multitude of fish came. And so we can see there that it was a matter of listening to the voice of Jesus and obeying the voice of Jesus. So Jesus reminded them of his power. The second thing I want you to see not only Jesus reminded them of his power, but Jesus reminded them of his provision. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that phrase, and you know, through the book of John, he never tells his own name. He never says, I am John. He, he is describing himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. What does that mean? Well, John's a little more spiritual than Peter. Not necessarily, but he was closer to Jesus, okay? I mean, he was the one leaning on his side at the Lord's Supper and the Last Supper, okay? There was a connection uh, between Jesus and John. And it says, now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Again, I don't know what season this was, uh, but there would be an indication that, you know, fishing, you know, it can be work. So uh, he took off, you know, part of probably his coat, and he just jumped, you know, he, he, put, that, he put that back on, and he, and he plunged into the sea. <laughs> I mean, Peter's always reacting to something. It was almost like, okay, you noticed him first, but I'm going to get to him first, all right? And it's just human nature, folks. Competition is just competition, all right? I'm not saying that is all that was going on there, but something uh, was going on there. Verse 8, but the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. I think it's interesting, the three things that were there. First, it was a fire with coals. Remember the last time Jesus and Peter, and, it, you know, this is before his resurrection, he was, he was around a fire, and people had asked him, man, you, you're, you're a gal, you're one of them, aren't you? Okay, so I think that was a reminder. Uh, the fish laid on it and bread. You know, again, I'm not saying it was the Lord's Supper, but your first question will be, well, where did Jesus get the fish? Okay, now we know he could get some bread. I mean, you, you can get bread anywhere, but folks, I'm just, I'm just saying he had breakfast already prepared for them. And it says, and Jesus said in them, bring some of the fish, fish which you have just caught. So, it really reminded me of a scripture in Mark chapter uh, 6, Mark chapter 6, 
verse 35. And you're very familiar with the story, but it reminds us of Jesus' provision. Mark 6, 35. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding counties and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And folks, Jesus knew they couldn't do it. All right, they couldn't do it. You, you couldn't have went to town and bought enough food for that many people. It was getting late, so the bread shop was probably already closed. But Jesus, again, I'm telling you, folks, he provides everything for us. What do you need? You need peace? He's got it. What do you need, love? He's got it. What do you need? I'm just telling you, he's got it. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said unto them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. So five loaves and two fish. Verse 39, then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. Why would he organize that? How else would you know he had 5,000? Okay, Jesus was wanting them to know. We're not talking about he fed 100 here. We're not talking about he fed 500. Okay, he wants them to know this is a miracle from Jesus. A miracle from Jesus. Verse 41 and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set them before them. What did he do? First thing he did was pray. He prayed. Folks, I just cannot tell you how important prayer is. Prayer is so important. Matter of fact, Tony and I met this past Saturday and we are looking to organize a prayer ministry in our church. Okay, I know we, we did prayer grams in the two churches that, that I had done before, and uh, we, are, we are looking, and we're going to have a meeting uh, later this month, an organizational meeting. You cannot pray too much, folks. You can't. And we're very excited about that opportunity. And it says, He looked up to heaven, blessed and set them before the disciples, the two fish he divided among them all. So they ate and were filled. Five fish, or five bread and two fish, and everyone was filled. Okay? It's impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Not only that, they took up 12 baskets of full fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And folks, that was the reminder. That's what he was saying in this particular scripture. I did it before, okay, and I can do it again. Folks, God wants to do miracles in our lives. He really does. And I'm telling you, the miracle that we forget these days, I think I said it Sunday, but it is a miracle every time somebody Praise to receive Jesus Christ. See, we want to, you know, we think, you know, the, the faith healing uh, is, is, a great heal, uh, is a great miracle. And I'm, I know God has touched lives. I'm not trying to say that's not important. Okay? But that person, again, eventually is going to die. But when they invite Christ to come into their life, I'm telling you, they never die, folks. They live with Christ forever. So we see Jesus reminding them of his power. We see Jesus reminding them of his provision. And the third thing I want you to see, Jesus reminded them of his presence. His presence. And Simon and Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish 153. Now here's the two things that were different this time. Okay, Last time it just said many. You know, many fish. He counted the fish, 153. They counted the people. Last time, remember, the nets broke. This time, the nets didn't break. 
okay? And again, don't make too much out of that, but I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's different. It's kind of like the way Jesus healed blind men. One time, he just touched their eyes, and, and they're healed. Another time, he puts mud. He spits in the dirt, puts mud in his, you know, you know in, in his hands and puts it on the guy and says, now go wash, go wash, and, and you will be healed. And it's simply saying God can do it any way he chooses, any way God chooses to do it. It's still a miracle of God. It is God. Folks, it is God who heals. Man has no healing power. And that's why I want to go back to the word prayer again. Prayer is so, so important. And although there were many, the net was not broken, and Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. So he just say? He just said, man, I've got breakfast already for you, okay? Where did he get the wood? Where did he get the fish? Where did he get the bread? It doesn't matter, folks. He's Jesus. He can do what he wants, all right? He had it already ready for them, yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? And it was one of those deals again. I think while they were coming and we, when they saw all this going on, they were reflecting back to what happened two years ago. Okay? And again, I don't think it was for a thing of comparison. I was, was thinking it was for a reminder. Jesus was saying, and you think of the first time he met Peter, what did he say? From now on, you're going to be fishers of men. That was the message. That was the reminder. Okay, yeah, you can go fish. Every now and then you can fish. Nothing wrong with fishing. But let's keep the, the most important thing the most important thing. Folks, I'm, I love all of our ministries. I love all of our missions that we are doing. But the most important thing, the reason God put us here for this place and at this time is to win people to Jesus Christ, to launch out into the deep, to throw our nets out. I love the, you know, the, the class that Scott is teaching, sharing Jesus without fear. Folks, I am telling you, fear is the number one reason people will not share the gospel. They are afraid of rejection. But what you have to understand is they're not rejecting you, okay? They're rejecting the Father. And I'm telling you, I have been in soul winning courses. I have been in the field in people's houses where, in my estimation, it was the lousiest presentation I've ever done. I just botched it up. I got things backwards. I ju it was just... And, and when I ask them, and mainly in EE, I, I mean, I'm telling you, for 14 years, I, we were in evangelism explosion at Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. We had 20 teams going out every Tuesday night, and we, I know one calendar year, we saw 356 people go through our baptismal waters in one year's time. I botched that up. And we, would you like to receive this gift of eternal life? The couple said, I sure would. And I thought, it's God, because that was a terrible presentation. Folks, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. They have to hear the Word of God, and they have to respond to the Holy Spirit. So we should not be afraid. I'm, a, I'm almost saying exact opposite. We, we should be afraid not to. Okay? I mean, if we really love God, if we really believe what he's teaching us and what he's showing the disciples, we should be busy about that. Yet none of the disciples know it's the Lord. In verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to him and likewise the fish. Now this is the third, third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I've got one last scripture I'd like you to go with me. Turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 16. And it's called the parable of the great supper. And he said unto them, this is Jesus' word, a certain man gave a great supper, invited many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things 
are now ready. And you have to understand, this is not just a supper. They use the word great supper. This person went to a lot of trouble to do this. This person spent probably a good amount of money to make this happen. In verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. <laughs> it's kind of like a coach. I had a football coach that told me, excuses are like ears. Everybody's got at least two of them. Okay? God's not looking for excuses. All right? Jesus is not looking for excuses. You can find a reason not to do something. All right? So, you, I mean, I know Steve and I, we would not pass up a free dinner. Okay? We just wouldn't do it. All right? And it says... The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And the other said, I have bought five uh, yoke of oxen, and, and I'm going to test them. And, you know, you have to do that, you know, that day, you know, just, just a question. And I, and I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Well, that might be the closest one that, that somebody could could make newlyweds, but verse 21, so that, the ser- so that the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. See, those people that had food and had things didn't run to the supper. The folks, the most needy people there. He said, you go out and people that, you, you, you ask and you invite people that are needy. People that, that would be grateful for this. Okay? And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Compel them that my house might be filled, for I say it unto you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. What is he saying, folks? There are a lot of people outside the church walls. There are a lot of people, and, and I thank God for our food ministry. Folks, I hope you understand how many people. We reach a lot of people with the food ministry, the food closet ministry. But again, you know, a lot of them in two more months, they are back. Okay, why? Because the food runs out. But those has the greatest need. The greatest need, folks, is for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All right? Because you'll eat. I mean, we all ate today. Most of us, unless you're fasting day day, you had a meal today. And after church, you'll walk in and you'll look at your wife and say, what are we going to eat? I'm hungry. Why? Because the food doesn't last. The food that Jesus gives them, the spiritual food he literally gives of himself, will last forever and ever and ever. The key here, folks, is we just have to keep asking. We don't know who is chosen. We don't know who is predestined. We don't know who needs to be saved. But God knows. So it is our job to go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. I don't know how many of you have watched our board over there, uh, Who's Your One? But uh, I I looked at Scott Sunday night and we were looking at the colored balls in there and there, there are, people are sharing, okay? People are inviting, people are being saved. And I, I pray that and Scott and I talked about this. This, this is not going to be something we're just going to do for a few months and then, and then forget it. Folks, we need to keep this going. That is a visual there of what is the most important thing in Rye Hill Baptist Church. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus' example, and thank you that he was teaching them and reminding them. God, I pray even this Sunday, as we do the Lord's Supper, I pray we will never forget what you have done for us. God, you took us out of that miry clay. You, fed, you set our feet 
on, on solid ground. You forgave us of our sins. And God, you wrote our names in the Lamb Book of Life. And God, we'll never forget that, ever. So God, I pray that we, as your children, would be actively pursuing other folks. I know they're not fish. We're not talking about fish here. We're talking about people. And God, I pray that we would get them in the boat, Lord. Just present. You can't get them in the boat unless you present, Lord. And I pray that we will be active in soul winning in our daily lives. God, you have the power. You have the provision. And your presence is with us. The Great Commission, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. But God, help us to go fishing. Lord, we can go fishing every day. In that sense, we can be looking for people to share with. And God, I know if we will abide in you, Lord, you will bring the increase. So God, I just thank you for that possibility, God. Outreach is important. It's extremely important. And it goes right in with evangelism, which is the heartbeat, God. Your heart is evangelism. It beats to evangelism. So, God, I thank you for this reminder that we have tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.